All right, hopefully you guys can hear me pretty good. I'm gonna turn this up. I'm gonna go over the equipment that we have in the studio space. When you guys get back here, we're gonna be working in a more professional studio space with backdrops and props and gels and professional strobe lights and external flashes and all of these things um, at your fingertips. So that is pretty exciting. Um, so I realize now that you know, you're going to learn about these things, but you're not going to be able to really use them yet. But I do want you to learn about them um, so that when you get back into the studio space, we are ready to go in the studio. So I'm going to be moving my webcam around doing some different things, um, but we're going to start right here. So here we go. We've got our Nikon. This is a D3400. This is the newest series that we have. Um, we there, I think the latest is the D3500. So we have the 3400. Um, so that's that. We have something called a trigger. I like to call it a trigger. This is what triggers the strobe lights. Strobe lights, and I'll show you in a minute what those are, are lights that are turned off until you hit your shutter button to take the picture and then they flash. And the output on those strobe lights is really intense and you can control it. So a studio lighting situation is meant to give you optimal control over your shot. And we have all of these tools to do that. So strobe lights, trigger. The trigger fits on the hot shoe of your camera. So there's hot shoes and cold shoes. The hot shoes actually transmit data between one device and another device. So this is a hot shoe. Um, it has a little toggle on it to loosen it up. Loosen it up and you slide it on there. And then you tighten it up so it doesn't fly off while you're using it and so that the hot shoe part is connected really well. And then you always want this part with all the buttons and the gears and things that control it to be facing you. It won't actually fit on the other way. So even if you tried to, it wouldn't work. All right, we're gonna take our lens off. A couple settings that we want to put our camera to while we're shooting in the studio space. Um, you want to set your ISO to 100. We want to do that because we have really good light in this space. So it's kind of like a bright sunny day. So if we can set our ISO to 100, then we have high resolution shot. We have a really nice quality shot. So you guys know how to do this already. You're going to set your ISO to 100. And mine's at 100. So you can't really see this screen and to do this now, but um, just know that you've already learned how to do that. So you can do that. Um, so the next thing we want to make sure is that because we're holding our camera and because our lens is only a certain millimeter length, um, the max millimeter length of our lens is 55. So our shutter speed, if you're holding your camera, has to be at least 1 60th of a second. Now these rules change when we're using strobe lights and here's why. The flash happens like that, so quick in a strobe light situation. If your shutter speed is not synced with the speed of that flash, then you will get this weird black bar um, in your photo. So if you're ever taking pictures with your strobe light situation and you're seeing this weird black bar in your image, um, it's because your shutter speed is not synced up with the speed of your strobe lights. So to make sure that we sync those, we want to set our shutter speed to 1 2 50th of a second, 1 over 2 50th of a second. I'm going to leave it there because any faster or any slower is not going to work with these lights. So that, that's a restriction we have to work with it. Um, but we can put our um, f-stop and our aperture wide open to get as much light as we want and we can also control the lights in our strobe and we can also use reflectors and we have a lot of ways of controlling this. Um, but the one thing we can't change at the moment is one uh, is the shutter speed, which needs to be set at 1 to 50th of a second. Okay, so we're going to make sure that we do that. And I'm also going to leave my f-stop alone right now because we have a really cool device called a light meter that will test and tell us what our f-stop should be set at. So this is a, what a light meter looks like. It's really, it's a neat little device. Um, and you hold it directly up to your subject's face. And this little white ball here is called the lumosphere. And this will read the light 
from um, that is reflecting off of your subject and tell you what f-stop to put your camera at. Now you might notice that this lumisphere is sticking out. You can also retract it in. So if you're photographing or testing the light on something that's two-dimensional like an artwork that's hanging on the wall, you want to put the lumisphere in. But if you're photographing something with dimension like a face, you want the lumisphere to stick out so it reads the light bouncing from a three-dimensional object. Okay, and we're going to talk about different types of light meters um, in our lecture, um, but I'm not going to get into that right now. So we have our light meter. We turn it on on the side here, and I'm going to explain to you how to use this. We also have to sync this with our camera settings. So we have to sync everything. So I don't know if we can see this or not. Let me hold it up here, possibly. Um, we have different settings here. We have the ISO. So you actually move this by tapping on the screen. You can move it up and down. And then we have our shutter speed, which right here is represented as a T, um, 250, which means 1 250th of a second. Um, and this is our f-stop. And this will change based off of what um, the meter is telling us when we, when we flash our strobes. So we'll go into that in a little bit. So that is our light meter. I always turn it off when I'm done so I don't waste, waste battery. Batteries for all these things can get quite expensive. And then of course it's a, it's a delicate expensive object device so it always goes back in its sheath here. Sheath. Um, what are some of the other things I have here? This is an external flash. So if you don't have strobe lights and you're maybe shooting outside or in a, in a dark space and you don't have a studio lighting set up or maybe you're shooting a wedding and you're you know, like shooting the reception, um, you want to use an external flash. And this is also a hot shoe item. So you take your trigger off. You wouldn't need your trigger unless you were using strobe lights in a studio setting. So that's you can remove that. And then the same thing, your buttons go facing you on the camera. And then you make sure it's nice and loose. And you slide it right on there. And then this is really important that we tighten that toggle because this is a heavy, heavy um, flash and you know if it flies off it's also very expensive um, and then we can we can direct the light in different directions here and we can also put something on here which is one of my favorite things in the world I don't know why I love this so much but this is a mag mod diffuser and this is basically just kind of a rubber um, diffuser it's a just a piece of rubber that fits over top of your flash here um, and it, it's, it softens the light and it spreads the light out and it makes it less flashy. You know, you've, already, you've probably used the flash on your camera already and you'll notice that it really kind of like washes out a lot of the highlights. So this really is a good solution because there's a lot more settings on the external flash that you can mess with, kind of like your strobe lights. And um, you can also attach things, not just tiny diffusers, but you can purchase this massive, like pillowy boxes, soft boxes on your external flash. Um, in order to attach this to this, we need this attachment here, which is basically just, it, it's a magnet. It fits on there, but you have to stretch it over the top of your flash. Um, and I like to actually do that before I attach it to the camera because then I can um, I don't have to mess with like the camera and the flash because you have to pull it pretty hard to get it over it so you kind of put it here like that and then you have to really stretch it over the top kind of contort it so you have to kind of have a good grip on the flash and it's hard to do when it's on the camera okay so now that's kind of stretched over and then you'll see that magnet just pops on and now it's attached to it okay and then now it's even heavier right <laughs> so we have to slide it back on there and then of course make sure that that's really really screwed on tight okay so now we have this big unit we have this camera we have this external flash and we have this magma diffuser um, I'm going to teach you in a different lesson how to use this unit 
Um, we're not going to go into that now. This is just kind of a, a demo on all of the things that we have at our fingertips. Um, and then I will do separate demos for you on how to use the studio lights and the gels and your external flash right here. So, and sometimes Miss Greninger doesn't even know her own strength and she screws this on so tight that she can't get it off again very easily, which is what's happened now. So I'm gonna let that sit for a second and I'm gonna show you the other things that we have. So this is a can. This goes on our strobe lights, and we would use this can if we were using um, gels. So these are colored gels. These are really fun. I know students really love to play with these because they're so dramatic. But you can see in here that we've got a ton of different colors here. We've got green, we've got blue, orange, pretty much the entire rainbow of colors and diffusers and um, you know, transparent papers to diffuse. We even have this gold, this beautiful gold reflector. So a lot of different things, and those actually get taped on top of, you put this on your strobe light so there's a light in there, and then you tape your gel over top. And the gels are designed to be heat resistant. You don't leave them on there a long time, but they're a lot safer than the fabrics that we were talking about with our DIY space. Okay, the last thing I'm gonna show you before I do a different demo, is this is that five-in-one reflector I was talking about. This is kind of like that um, light blocker you see in your car window, right? So it's gonna pop open. Let me do it over here so it doesn't knock some stuff off. So we've got all these reflectors in there, reflectors and diffusers. And it's called a five-in-one because it's all zipped together in one disc, but you can take it off and you can remove it and you can change it. So this one is the diffuser. You can kind of see the camera equipment through it. So that's like the DIY diffuser I had you make. And then we have a gold side, which makes your photos really warm and, and kind of glowy. And then we have a white side, which is more opaque than your diffuser, so it's like a reflector. Um, and then we have a silver side, which makes your photos a lot warmer, I'm sorry, cooler actually, and the, the reflected light is a lot um, sharper and harsher. And then we have an anti-reflector, so if we want to make something darker, we can put the black on. And you just pick which one you want. I think I'll pick the gold because it's fun. And then we just put this, this diffuser inside and we place the part, the one, the reflector that we want out on the outside, um, and that's the one we're using. And then, that, then the diffuser frame holds it in place, and then we can, you know, move it around. Whenever you're shooting, it's a good idea to have a, an assistant to hold these things and help you with things. So those are our things. Those are our parts. These are all our accessories all of our tools for shooting in the studio and also outside of the studio space.
Okay. So my apologies for the camera shake. Um, I am hand holding my webcam right now, and I realize that I could it could totally give you um, make you feel nauseous. But I'm going to do my best to not bounce around too much while I show you these things. So this is my studio setup. This is J3. If you have never been in J3, it is the computer lab. This is where we have our photo class um, when you're at school, which is cool. Um, we have some equipment in here that has been installed. We have three different colored papers that kind of come down in the middle of the room. And this is our makeshift studio space. We have Ellen Chrome lights. So we've got one light that's a little bit shorter and smaller than this other big light. These are our strobe lights. These are the lights that will flash. Um, I had mentioned before that we have this trigger. This fits on top of the hot shoe of your camera. And when you take a picture with your shutter, this trigger is connected to the strobe lights. And those strobe lights will flash when you hit your shutter. So everything is connected. Right now the lights are on because you wouldn't be able to see anything with this webcam if they weren't. But I am going to turn them off and show you um, how this works if I can. I need an assistant, you guys. I need your help. Okay, so these are the back. This is the back of our Ellen Chrome strobe light. So to turn it on, we do that. It beeps a lot. It's going to beep. It beeps when it's ready. It pretty much beeps when you can take a photo. So whenever you change any of these settings, um, like the output of the light, you have to wait for it to beep because it kind of needs to catch up on itself. Um, so this prop light here, when you turn this prop light on, you can't see it now because um, the light's already on in the classroom. But if you wanted to see the modeling of your subject with the light on, you turn the prop light on. But you never want to leave it on all the time because it's a waste of the bulb and you don't need it because it strobes, it flashes when you take your picture. So there's different settings. There's off and there's like a really dim one and then a brighter one and then you turn it off again. So that's how we, when we hit this, the prop light, that's what happens. I wish the webcam light would focus a little better, but that's, it is what it is. Okay, um, these settings will change the output of your flash. So the lowest is two and the highest is six. And then you'll see it's gonna flash and then beep. So that flash means it's, it's adjusting and then the beep means it's adjusted. You can turn off the beep because some people think it's annoying, but I kind of like it because it tells me when I'm ready to shoot. So just FYI in this space, look at how tiny it is. Two is perfect. If you go anything above that, you're really having to deal with blown out photos and trying to keep up with your light. It's just too much light. And in a lot of cases, we actually don't even use both lights because it's so small in here. If we were in a larger studio space where the light was bouncing off of things and it wasn't so light tight like this lab, um, we would probably need more. So you see how long it's taking. It's still beeping, which means it's still adjusting. But eventually it will beep. Um, this is the exact same setup as this. It's just that this, the, um, the light is bigger. Not the actual bulb, but this um, softbox is bigger. So, and it's shaped differently. So we can use it for different things. All right, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's, we're not gonna go over that yet. Okay, so how do we take a picture with this setup? Well, the first thing we need to do is make sure that our trigger settings are correct and they're synced with our Ellen Chrome strobe light. Um, so a couple things about these settings. I don't know how well you can see these numbers, but we have two rows of numbers that are lit up here. The first one, these are called groups. It says all one, two, three, or four. Um, the reason for this setting, which is really handy if you're shooting bigger, is that you, have, you can group lights. So if you want to trigger only a certain light, or if you want to have several lights in one group and several lights in another group, you can sync all of that. And this uh, trigger allows you to do that. We have a pretty simple setup here, so I always set it to all. But I, if I set, like for example, if I wanted to set this small light to group one and the bigger light to group two, 
then I, and I only wanted group one to trigger, then I would set this to group one. And I would only be using that one byte in group one. Um, and then I could toggle back and forth without having to go to the light to change it with my trigger. So it's kind of like a remote control. Uh, the second row of numbers, this has to do with frequency. So if you're shooting, maybe you're shooting in a big warehouse in LA or something and you've got three studios set up and everybody's working off of frequency waves. And if you're all set to the same frequency, you're gonna have people next to you taking pictures, triggering your strobe lights because you're in the same radio frequency waves. So again, we are super simple here. We do not have that problem but that is an explanation of what those are. And then on here, it's called channels. But on your strobe lights, it's, they're called frequencies. So we just set all of our fre frequencies for, for both strobe lights to one. So we're in channel one and we're in group one. We're just in one. Um, if you want to turn up the light output on, for example, this light in group one, then you, would, you can actually do that by hitting the plus. And then you can hear in a second you'll hear it beep. That means that it adjusted that strobe light. So this is this is literally a remote control. If you also want to test the light, you can hit the trigger. So that's the trigger button. So those are what these buttons are for. And right now I'm going to go turn the light off, and we're going to learn how to use the light meter. So this webcam really doesn't pick up light very well. So I think I might actually, I'm gonna turn up this light super bright, just so that you can actually see. So again, I'm working with my grandma head here <laughs> and the sequins. Um, and I know the webcam isn't, the webcam is not gonna show you the nice photo that I've taken here, but it will show you how to do it, how to use the light meter. And it will also, I will post the photos that I've taken so that you can truly see. I'm gonna actually turn that down to two. And then I'm gonna turn the prop light off and you can see the prop light's off and now it's on dim and now it's on bright and now it's off again. So those are the settings. For now, I'm gonna turn it on just so that you can see what I'm doing. All right, so I've got my meter my light meter, my Taconic light meter. Um, we talked about this. Okay. We talked about turning it on. We talked about the settings that it needed to have to sync with our trigger. So we're shooting grandma here, and we want the lumosphere to be sticking out because she is three-dimensional, and our lumosphere is gonna read three-dimensional light. We talked about the settings being at 100 ISO to match up with our, our camera. We talked about the shutter speed being one two fiftieth of a second to match up with the syncing of our Ellen Chrome strobe lights. Our flash has to sync with the shutter speed. Okay, so these settings are correct. So now what we want to do, there's a button on the side that says measure. So we're measuring the light. And on here, if this light was off, right, we talked about the prop light being off when we're shooting. Um, we can trigger the light again using our remote controller trigger. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So you want to read the light in several different places. So I like to put it on the light side of the face. I hold the measure button in and then I trigger the light. And then I look in the middle there and it tells me what um, f-stop I should be at, 5.6. Okay. And then but when I move it, I want to read the shadow side too. So I hit measure again and I do the trigger. And now it's at 2.8, less light. Sometimes I even do a reading in the middle of the face and it will typically give me either the same as the bright or a little bit lighter. So let's try it maybe right there. Or four, okay? So we've got 
2 point something forward and 5 point 6. Those are the f stops. That is what the light meter is telling me. I need to set my f stop to. Now, in my experience with this setup, I start here, so I never, I never really end here. I usually am around 8. But I also have to think about um, my depth of field. Right? Do I want a shallow depth of field when I'm shooting this? And if I do, um, 8 would be too much depth. Okay? If I want my background to be blurry, I probably want to be at a 4 or 5.6. So let's start at a 5.6 and see where we go from there. Okay? So I've got my reading. I can turn my light meter off. Now I'm going to go over here and my webcam is literally where I need to be standing. Um, I'm going to take the shot anyways. So I'm going to set my desktop to 5.6, my ISO is 100, and my shutter speed is 1 over 250th of a second. I'm ignoring the light meter in my camera. I'm listening to the Sikonis light meter. excited. All right, so now, now that we have a nice shot, what do we do? We play. So how do we play? We play with light and we play with shadow. So what can I do to play with the light? I can move the light. If I wanted to split lighting, split lighting is when you put the light source to the left of the face and you get this really intense line down the middle of the face with the shadow on one side and the highlight on the other side. So that's split lighting. If you move it a little bit closer, like a clock, right? Counterclockwise. You're looking at the changing shadow on her face. And you just take pictures and you look and you experiment. You can kind of see the shadow moving like like the moon, like the phases of the moon, right? What happens when we put it right in front? This gets challenging when you're shooting, when your light source is leaning away. Yeah, it's just amazing how it changes. And once I move it in front of her face, I feel like it's too much. It's too bright. There's no contouring on her face. It's not as interesting. I can move it back. What happens when I move it back? I get a little bit of a shadow on the side of her face when I move it back. Um, what happens, let me show you this, the lights can go up and down. So the settings on here, you can adjust the height of your light. So what happens when I put it down and I tilt the can up, all of a sudden I have a spooky grandma. She's got shadows underneath her chin and her face. So when you guys get back into the studio, these are the experiments I want you to do. This is how we learn. So I'm feeling like that's a little overexposed. What can I do? How can I change my light? Well, I can up my f-stop. So maybe I go to 7.1. Let's try that. What happens to my picture when I do that? Yeah, much better. More information in the highlight. I can also back this away. That changes the light. That lessens the light. There's multiple ways of changing the light. Okay, I can also lift the light can up as high as I can. I can change the tilt of the head back, maybe down, and then I can lift this up as tall as I want. Just tell it it'll go way up high, down below. What is the effect you're going for? This is how you learn to take good photos, you experiment. I like that, that's pretty dramatic. That's 
still have a pretty shallow depth of field, even with that 7.1, I still see blur in the background and I'm still getting some blur in the two point. So now what do I do? So many things. I try on my reflectors, right? I pull my gold. Look at the change in that. Just looking through the webcam, you can probably see it. I'm filling the shadow with that gold. Okay, her face is already pretty yellow, so it's hard to really see it, but move it around. Have your assistant do this while you're looking through your viewfinder. And you say, stop, that's perfect. Light, fill in the shadow underneath the face. As long as it's not in a shot, play with it. What's it gonna do? Um, all of, try all of your different diffusers and reflectors and anti-reflectors, try them all, all five. And then, I wanna show you one more thing before I end this, and that is how do I change this light soft box and put a gel on it. How do I get a colored color cast on the photo? So I'm gonna drop this down. Um, you do need to turn this off when you're doing this because the light gets hot and you should probably let it cool down. I'm not sure what you can see. Let me see here. webcam a bit so you can see what I'm doing. I need a, an assistant for several reasons to turn all my lights on and off for me to adjust, adjust my cameras, all of it. I miss you guys, not, you, <laughs> not just because I need assistance, but for lots of reasons, but okay. So this up a bit. It's hard for you to see what I'm doing. Let me switch it. So there's this blue button here. It's the toggle button. So you undo it. It's the lock. And then you rotate this and you pull it out. Now this is still hot, so I do not want you to change this while it's hot. But I'm going to do it because I want to show you. And then you put this can on there. And I am really going to be careful you find you line it up and then you torque it so it locks and then you lock it a second time so now we just have this can without the soft box and then I'm gonna pick a certain color and maybe we'll go for something extreme the blue is always really kind of a popular one because it really shows up the red's popular too and then I'm gonna take blue tape and all I have to do is take a Sometimes um, students like to cast the color behind the subject against the colored backdrop, and then all of a sudden you're mixing color, you're mixing light and color. And when you mix light with color, it's different than mixing paint and it's different than mixing glaze. Mixing light and color is really uh, science. So we can talk about that at some point. Turn off the big light and see what happens. I'm going to be publishing all these photos so that you can see. Okay, I'm going to turn on my prop can see what it's doing. So it look, looks purple. That was the dull light. No, that was a bright one. So look how much duller it is with the bright light. So what does that mean? We have to change our camera settings. Okay, that's not enough light to really get a correct exposed shot. So I'm going to bump my um, f-stop back to, I'm going to go to 4.5 and see what I get. I'll work my way up. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. She looks like
like she's metallic. I'm gonna move it. I'm gonna get some super dramatic shot here with the split lighting here. Um, so in this case, I feel like I need more light. So how do I deal with that? Right? How do I? My light source is bright as bright as it can be. Actually, it is not. So what do we need to do? We need to change the settings on our scope. I'm gonna go up to, let's just go crazy and go up to six. Now we're at a six. What happens when we're at a six? She looks an alien. That is too bright. So let's take it down to a three. I said I'd say halfway would be perfect. I'm gonna leave it right there. So and if you put a can light with a gel on the other side, you're mixing your color. Oh. So cool. Oh, so I'm getting a little bit of a shutter bar too for some reason. Okay, so I still feel like it needs a little bit more light. So what do I do? I use my reflector. What if I mix some gold? This is going to be hard for me to shoot because I am just my myself. I'm my one person here. I need someone to hold it. So I'm going to get in front of the webcam here and I'm going to take my shot while I'm holding the reflector up. You can see here. I'm going to crop it. I'm trying to seal the shadow in. That's what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. That's cool. She looks like she's a, like a grandma mermaid. She's underwater. Okay. So that is all I really wanted to show you today. There's so much more you could do, but I just wanted to kind of ignite your sense of um, adventure when it comes to shooting in the studio. All the things we have and can use and all the things that you could possibly um, create at home. You know, this might give you some inspiration for what you do at home. So, okay.